Good evening. One of the elder Hasidim of the previous generation asked, what is, tell me in three words, what is Hasidus? Now we know Hasidus is 300 years old. The writings of Hasidus are less, certainly 250. Hundreds of volumes of Hasidus uh, explaining Torah's Hasidus have already been written and published. Hundreds of volumes, I'm saying, is in Chabad literature itself. In addition to the uh, literature of Hasidus that is outside of Chabad. The Rebbe himself published, edited words of Torah, I would say probably about uh, 60 volumes, in addition to another 50 volumes of printed, um, of printed letters uh, of significance. And here there was, there was an elder Hasid, asked younger Hasidim, can you tell me what is Hasidus in three words? And they were all wondering, how can you put all of Hasidus into three words? So he answered, all of Hasidus in three words is a verse in the Torah we say it in Davening, Ein Oid Milvadoi. There is nothing besides Hashem. Those three words, in Hebrew it's three words, Ein Oid Milvadoi, there's nothing besides, nothing besides Hashem. In English you can say it as well. That is the point of all of the Hasidic literature. And then he considered, can you, then he continued, can you tell me all of Hasidus in two words? And they were stumped again. So he said, sometimes the verse says, Ein oid, nothing else. And you understand it means nothing else besides Hashem. Ein oid. And then he said, can you tell me Hasidus all in one word? And here they were truly stumped. And here he played a trick. He said, all of Hasidus in one word, kaklach. What's kaklach? That's actually an abbreviation. Chav kuf lamet ches. Kula kamei kaloi chashif. Kula kamei kaloi chashif. Chav ches. Kaloi chashif. Everything before Hashem is insignificant. That's all of Hasidus in one word. We're learning now chapter 20. And in chapter 20 is the first place in Tanya where the Alter Rebbe touches this idea, idea of the nothingness of everything and the only true existence is Hashem. And although it sounds like a philosophical, a philosophical issue, but nevertheless, here in Tanya, he is using this deep philosophical issue in an applied way, how it applies to our conduct, every act, a thought, a, a thought, a speak, a words that we say or action that we do. And this is to develop the idea that he started in chapter 18 and continued in 19. That each of us have an inner love, a subconscious love to Hashem, the Ava Mesoteris. And this subconscious love is so strong and so deep that a person, a Yid, instinctively would give up his life before giving up his God. Now, and, and therefore, the Alter Rebbe said, it is close to all of us to serve Hashem with all our heart. So it's close to us. Why is it close to us? Because we are already programmed with spiritual, godly DNA to love Hashem. It's an instinct in the programming of our Nishama. So this idea that a person loves a son which such passion that he would give up his life, the Alter Rebbe said this even applies 
to people who are distant from observing the mitzvahs. And he made the observation that we find throughout history, though people who were apparently distant from doing the mitzvahs, but when it came to a test of faith, they gave up their life rather than their God. And that's because deep inside they had that, that godly DNA which is expressed in the, in, 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 in the hidden love, in the subconscious love. So now we know how this could apply in a, a test of faith. But how do we apply this in everyday life? The verse that this was built on was that it's close to, it's within reach and close to each one of us to do what's right. To do Torah. It's close to us. And we see that more often than not it's, it's a challenge to do uh, what's right and to do Torah and mitzvahs. And he's saying, you know, just like there's a, an attest of faith and a moment of truth, we are all ready to give it all for Hashem. That's the way it could apply in everyday life. And that's a big question. When there's a moment, there's a test of faith. Over here, our adrenaline uh, runs to the, comes to the fore. Our spiritual adrenaline, and now we're, 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 all, we're all eager to do uh, and defend our Yish, Yiddishkeit. But in everyday life, how do we apply it to everyday life? And this is going to, and to explain this, he's going to go into a philosophical discussion into the oneness of Hashem. What does it mean that Hashem is one? And what, what does it mean, we said before, that all of Hasidus, in one word or two words, is that everything is Hashem. There's nothing besides Hashem. So we're starting Perkhaf. It is well known that the first two commandments, where Hashem commanded us in the belief of God and forbid us to have other gods. These two mitzvahs is, the, and incorporates all of the Torah. This is the principle that incorporates all of the Torah. And it's very key words over, over here. He says it incorporates, it's klolis kola taira. That means it includes the whole taira. And he explains, In the commandment, I am your God, when Hashem said, I am your God, this includes all of the positive mitzvahs. And the commandment, you shall not have other gods, this includes all of, all of the prohibitions, the, 600 and, uh, the 365 prohibitions. Now here's, here is a chidush, and a new insight that the Alter Rebbe is telling us over here. Generally, we know that these two commandments, they are the foundation for all of Yiddishkeit. Because the, the axiom and what is based all of Yiddishkeit is that there's a God. So if there's a God, then he's the boss and there are no other gods. And therefore you have to listen to all Hashem's mitzvahs. So therefore we have 248 positive mitzvahs and then we have 365 prohibitions what is the foundation for all of this? The foundation for all of this is that, there, that there's God, that there's Hashem. So now we have a foundation. What the Alter Rebbe is saying over here is, it's not about a foundation. That of course it's the foundation for all of the mitzvahs. But it's more than a foundation. In, the, in this mitzvah, it is included in the, in the command, I am God, is included and it incorporates all of the mitzvahs. In other words, when somebody does any mitzvah, he is connecting to Hashem, God. He's, uh, he is observing the mitzvah, I am God. And when someone 
stays away from doing what is forbidden, he is fulfilling the mitzvah, don't have other gods. It's all included in that mitzvah. It's not only a foundation for all of Yiddishkeit, it includes all of Yiddishkeit. These two commandments include all of Yiddishkeit. You want to know all of Yiddishkeit in two commandments? 613 included in two commandments, in two mitzvahs? Anoichi, I am your God. Don't have other gods. That includes all the 630 mitzvahs, all of Torah, all of our literature, it includes it all. These two mitzvahs. How? That's, his, that's what he's going to explain soon. And to, to, to emphasize this point, that these two mitzvahs incorporate and include all of Yiddishkeit, that's why Hashem told us those two commandments directly. Our sages teach us that the Yidin didn't hear all ten commandments directly from Hashem. It was only the first two commandments they heard directly from Hashem. The other eight commandments came through Moshe Rabbeinu. They didn't hear it, certainly they didn't hear it in the same way that they heard the first two commandments. Exactly how they heard it is a whole discussion by Jewish commentators and philosophers. But it's clear the Gemara says, and those two commandments, the Gemara says, that those who heard, we heard from Hashem, the awesome, awesomeness of Hashem. Kemaimer Azal, like our sages say, so, Neishem Klolos Kola. And the reason why these two, because if we heard these two friends from Hashem, it's as if we heard the whole Torah from Hashem. Because if we have a God, that includes all the mitzvahs. And therefore when he said, I am your God, included in this is all the mitzvahs. Then we're all automatically going to do all the mitzvahs. And when we heard, don't have other gods, included in this is all of the prohibitions. Don't have other gods, so don't do all this, all this, everything that's forbidden. And this is going to be developed philosophically in the coming uh, chapter and the next chapter after that. And therefore, this needs explanation. And he says, to explain this well, he's going to begin into the idea of oneness of Hashem. Why does he have to explain this well? Because one could say, how, how is it possible that the commandment, don't have other gods, that includes don't eat kosher. That includes don't eat on Yom Kippur. That includes all of the mitzvahs, put out, that all, all, the, all the prohibitions. One can argue, of course I won't worship other gods, because that's, that's a heavy weight, that's, that's fundamental. I'm a Jew after all. But how is that connected with not eating pork, with not eating on Yom Kippur? How is that connected with mitzvahs that don't seem to carry the weight of idol worship. And idol worship, I'll give my life for idol worship. But perhaps some of the other mitzvahs, I will not be so, so ready to, to sacrifice so much. And what he's going to explain in the following chapters is that actually, if you think deeply, every sin has in it a form of idol worship. And every mitzvah has in it the recognition that I am your God. And it's easy to say this, but he's going to develop, develop this through the Kabbalah and the philosophy of Yiddishkeit. And much of this is, one, is some of the most fundamental points in the Kabbalah. Therefore, to explain this, we have to mention So we have to go, uh, go into what is the essence of the oneness of Hashem. 
He's called the only one. What does it mean, the one is of Hashem? Now we know in the Shema, the declaration of faith of the Jewish people is to say the Shema. And what is the Shema? Shema Yisrael Hashem Alekeinu Hashem Echad. Hashem is one. That, is the, that sentence says it all. But understanding that sentence is, 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 it can be understood in many levels. You can understand what does it mean Hashem Echad, Hashem is one, it can be understood in many levels. The most basic level of understanding is there's one God, there's one, He has no partners, there's no, uh, there's not a partnership of three, there's not a partnership of anything, of two, there's one. That's it. One Hashem. One God. That's it. And that's, of course, a fundamental point. The oneness of Hashem. The Rambam has a, a, a deeper idea into that, which we're not going to go into over here. But what Hasidus emphasizes, starting from the Bashem Tev, is that what is the, the, the inner meaning of the oneness of Hashem? Hashem is one and the only one. That nothing exists besides Hashem. That the whole world and the universe and everything that we could see or experience in our dimension in this world, all is insignificant and is as if it doesn't exist because the only, and, and the only, because the, the real reality is that the only true existence is only Hashem. So therefore, what does it mean Hashem is one? It's not only that He's one and there's another, or there's, there, He is one in the dimension of God, and then there's a, and a big world out there. The conventional understanding uh, before the Baal Shem, certainly before the Kabbalah, was there's Hashem, He created the world, He's the master of the world. So He is like a puppeteer who's controlling His puppets. So this is, of course, all of Judaism and, and, and maybe even other religions understand that Hashem is the boss. And it's like a puppeteer controlling the puppets. But if that's the case, then it would come out that the puppeteer is, is a person and the puppets have no independence of their own, they have no will of their own, they cannot make a move without the master, but they are not the master. They are, there's the master, there's the puppeteer, and then there's the puppet show. They are the, 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 those dolls, those puppets. So there's something else that exists besides the puppeteer. They are the puppets and the stage and everything. And what is Chassidah saying? Well, Shem is saying that what does it mean Hashem is one? Not that He's the all-powerful, not only is He the all-powerful one, not only is He the boss, because He created the world, so He's stronger than the world, but He's, he's not only is the all-powerful one, but that He is the only one. And the puppets have no real existence, and the stage, there's nothing else there besides Hashem. And that is, and that is, and, and this idea is fundamental and in Yiddishkeit. Now, I must point out, it doesn't mean that the world is a figment of our imagination. It doesn't mean that the world doesn't exist. And like the Rebbe said, if it says in the Torah, Bereish is Baralikim, that Hashem created the world, then the world exists. So the world physically exists and that's why when we do a mitzvah and we take something that is secular and we make it holy or we take our bodies and make object of mitzvah out of them or take a, 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 a cow and we use it to eat to make a mitzvah or the skins to make mezuzah and tefillin. So we're changing something from secular and profane to make it holy. And that is real. 
So what does the Baal Shem Tov mean that the, that the only existence is Hashem? So what it means is the truth is the world exists. But when you put the world into its true perspective, you realize that it is so insignificant in the big picture, like what we explain in, the, in this chapter, in the next chapter, it is so insignificant that it is as if it actually doesn't exist. And to a certain degree, its existence is so, is so insignificant that it doesn't exist. But even though the reality is that there is a physical world here. And it will explain how this works, this oneness that we can actually say that nothing exists besides Hashem. And first he brings a few verses that support this idea that there's nothing besides Hashem. And he says, We say this in the Davin there. All of us believe that He is the only one. Just like before creation, there was only Hashem. So too, after creation, there's only Hashem. So here we're comparing the world, the, the, the existence, general existence. Hashem was the only one before creation, and is the only one after creation. And even though the world was a real creation. Nevertheless, it is so insignificant that we say it's the same. There's a verse that says, I didn't change. Why does it mean that I didn't change? I didn't change, just like Hashem had no company, He was there long before creation. He continues to be that way after creation. Because this world and the spiritual worlds do not make any change in his oneness when he created them for something from nothing. <coughs> now, philosophically, the, the philosophers had an issue with Hashem being involved in creation. And here he doesn't really go into that. The fact that Hashem it was involved in creation and no change happened to him in conventional Jewish philosophy has been understood to mean that he didn't have to exert himself. When Hashem, when I, when I make something, so I have to f focus my mind on it, I have to make a plan, I have to focus on it. Let's say I'm making a picture. So I have to get a camera, I have to focus the camera, I have to point the camera, I want to see that it's, everything is in the right place, everything is in the frame of the camera, and my frame of mind is focused on taking the pictures. So I am occupied with it. Before I wasn't, and now I am. So if that would be the, the case in creation, that means Hashem is limited. Because before He created, He was not occupied, and then he was occupied and preoccupied with creation. And that we say Hashem did not change. It didn't affect him. Because, it's, it, because the creation is not something that, that limits his attention. Hashem is infinite and all-powerful. And therefore he can create with, 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 without losing any of his um, attention and selfhood and so on. That is one of the explanations why in the Torah the creation is described as speech. Why is the creation described that Hashem said, let there be light? And one of the explanations for that was that the closest way to explain how Hashem created the world effortlessly, the closest way to explain that would be by speech by a human being for something to happen he has to make it happen so he has to get out of his seat go to the place where he's doing something and he has to use his hands 
he has to use his, his strength to make something happen. Like they say, things don't happen by themselves. Uh, however, by Hashem, things, things could happen as if automatically He wills it and it has happened. So since the Torah is written a way that even the simplest person could relate to, so the Torah says, through speech He created the world. Because through speech in the human form is done some, if you do something through speech, it's as if it's effortlessly. Certainly by the speech of Hashem is not the human form of speech, and there's no sound waves, but that's another discussion. What does it mean? The, what is the, 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 the Jewish philosophical, and certainly Hasidic and Kabbalistic meaning of speech? But here, and therefore when we say, Aniyah, violation, he says, Hashem, didn't change by creating the world he didn't have to exert himself he didn't have to change where he's at or, or what or his 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 status or his existence in any way but in tanya here he's saying something deeper than that it's not only that the creation happens effortlessly and therefore there's no change but deeper than that even after creating the world there is no change because really the same oneness of God, that He is the only existence, the only real existence, that is so even after creation. And that's going to need an explanation as we're going to continue in the chapter. Just He was the only one before creation. He's the only one after creation. Why? Because everything in before Him is insignificant. I said before that Elder Chassid said one word to say the foundation of Chassidus. I said, he said, Kaklach. Because in many Maimorim of the later generations of the Rebbe, this, these four words are written in abbreviation as if it's one word. Chaf, Kuf, Chaf, Ches. Over here he uses that line. It's a line taken from Kabbalah, from Zayar that everything before him is like nothing. Kula kame, everything before him, kalai chashev, doesn't count, is insignificant. mamish, it's like nothing. It's like nothing exists. Because the creation of everything from nothing to, from nothing to something is only from Hashem. The Chayusam Vikiyumam. Not only the creation, but their continued existence. Hamakayim Shlayachz La'ayim V'yafes Kishahaya. That main, the maintenance that the, the world continues to exist in these thousands of years since creation, all of that is Hashem's energy. Ein El Advar Hashem Ruach Piv Yisbarach Hamulubash Beh. It's all Hashem's energy that is in it. And this is a fundamental point in Hasidus. In the following way. The first point that I'm going to say now is, is more elaborated in the second section of Tanya in the Shari Yechud. And this is what he says over here, that all of creation is from Hashem's speech. What does it mean? That when Hashem said words, He didn't say physical words like we know it. But just like when I say, when I'm speaking, you're not listening to the words with your eardrums as if, as if the vocal cord is giving, making sound waves and your eardrums are reflecting those sound waves. That's not what this is about, even though that's what's happening. It's really the message that I'm saying. You're listening with your brain. But you have to hear the sound waves because they're carrying the message. But speech is really communication. It's not about the mechanism of the sound waves and the eardrums. It's about communication. And when we say that Hashem gave speech, it means that Hashem communicated, or in terms of Kabbalah, He made flow an energy from himself to create things. And it's that godly energy that's in every 
every molecule and every atom and everything that exists that makes them exist. So their real existence is really totally dependent on the godly energy that's in them. Now, that is in the beginning of creation and it continues th through, throughout the creation. If Hashem would withdraw His godly energy from the world, it would turn to the nothingness of before creation. He says, There was uh, once asked they once asked someone if Hashem wanted to create the world. Someone asked a few people if Hashem wanted to destroy the world. How would he destroy the world? So there was a man who asked a few people how would he destroy the world? It was a chassid who asked a few people. So one said if Hashem wanted to destroy the world he would have a meteor from out of space crash into the world bigger than planet earth that would destroy the whole world another one said he would make earth warming so hot, hot <laughs> that the whole planet earth would be flooded with water a third one said another way hashem how would how he would how he would destroy the world and the chassid said you're all wrong hashem doesn't need meteors how does hashem doesn't need floods how Hashem doesn't need earth warming. How, is, how would Hashem destroy the world? He just has to withdraw his energy. Not only withdraw his energy, has to cease continuing to give the energy. He doesn't have to withdraw anything. Hashem is giving us energy, that's why we're here. If the next minute there's, we are here, it's because Hashem extended his gracious life force to give us energy. And if he decides no more, that's it. Oops, there's no, there's no more world. He doesn't need anything else. People who responded that if Hashem wants to destroy the world, he's going to use a meteor. But the assumption is that the world is as if it's independent of Hashem. If the world is, is something which is independent of Hashem, and what is Hashem? He's the big puppeteer who's big and strong and he can, he made the world so he's stronger than the world. So now how would he have to destroy the world? He would have to take something bigger than the world that he also controls and, and throw a meteor that's bigger than the world on a planet. But that's the assumption that the, 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 the puppeteer is not a control. It didn't make the puppets, that the puppets have an independent existence, that the world has an independent existence. But Hasidus and Kabbalah explains that the world doesn't have an, an independent existence. Its whole existence depends on, 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 on the godly energy. So if Hashem ceases to continue the energy flow, then the next second it will no longer exist as if before the emptiness there was before creation. Now that's part of this story. Over here he continues with another, with another point. The other point that he's going to make over here is that when the, even when the world exists, it is in, it, its insignificance. And he's going to go into an, another approach than what is said in the second book of Tanya the insignificance he's going to go into the insignificance of the world and he's going to explain this by using the idea of speech we know that Hashem created the world through speech and this is the Torah and I explained, I explained the, the point at least that Hasidic explained what does it mean speech and it's not literally, it's, it's literal, it's an energy force that makes the world. But it's similar to speech. So he's going to develop the idea of how insignificant one word that we pronounce. We pronounce a word, right? I say the word table. How significant is that? So now, I say the word table, compare that 
to my power of speech. What the Alter Rebbe is going to do is going to make uh, a, 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 as, as, as something like a value system. What do you give the value of one word compared to a thousand words or a million words? I don't know, let's say a person during their lifetime they say 10 billion words. It's probably a certain number. Certainly every day they count every word we say. So let's say a person in their life doesn't say 10 billion or a trillion words. So compare one word to a trillion words. So you'd say that word is insignificant. So I said this Thursday table. And during my lifetime, Hashem should give me long life. I'm going to say a trillion words. So one word, how significant is one word to a trillion words? You'd say it's insignificant. Or like a term that's used in our literature, one drop of water of the ocean. So the, of all the oceans of the world, all the oceans in, in our literature, all the oceans are connected. They are, they're physically connected, but it's considered like one big ocean. All oceans is like one big ocean. So one drop of water taken from the oceans is, is now if I take a drop of water from the oceans it's going to become less water so one drop is insignificant but then he's going to explain you know that's not really insignificant because how what are the oceans made of? drops of water if one drop is nothing then true drops of nothing is and if, if, one, if one drop is nothing then two drops then a million drops then a trillion drops then after a while I'm going, to be, I'm going to be emptying the water from the ocean. Because there is so much water in the ocean. So it's not unlimited. Similarly, so let's say one word compared to a trillion words. So yes, it's quite insignificant, but it's not totally insignificant. Because one word is to get, to get a trillion, you need to add up one and one and one and one and one and one. Eventually I'll get a trillion. So it's one digit. And what's a trillion? A trillion. So one to a trillion is still has some significance. But how about infinity? One to infinity. One to infinity is insignificant. Why? Because one and a trillion, how far is it from one till infinity? Infinity. How far is it a trillion to infinity? Infinity. So there's this, this is idea of infinity in math and philosophy, this idea of infinity. There's, there are infinite numbers that can go on and on and on and on and on, right? You're the accountant. <coughs> It, numbers can go on and on and on and on. So, so one digit and a trillion is equal to infinity. So now if I compare one to infinity, to the, the numbers that go to infinity, so I can say, well, that's really insignificant. So, all right? So that's one to infinity. So, and we're going to be leading on to how insignificant Hashem created the world with one word, or with ten words, or with ten sayings. But Hashem is infinite. But this is just a tip of the iceberg of the calculations He's going to make now. He's going to make a, a value. You want to say that the world, yes, the world physically was created. So the physical word it is. But if you think about how insignificant and tiny it is, the insignificance of it is that it's, it's basically nothing. I said many times when I go up on the plane, when I'm on a plane, I'm traveling somewhere, I like to look out the window. And when the plane rises, I look down. How the houses become smaller and smaller and the people become smaller and smaller. <laughs> And it's like, an, like, it's so insignificant. And I'm thinking always to myself, 
You see in that house down there, the husband and wife are arguing over who knows what, you know, this or that. And the higher I go, says the, the people, the house. It's all insignificant. Look up here. And I'm on a plane. Think about people are in outer space. And then there's, there's uh, our, our um, um, you know, uh, the universe and, and the galaxies, all that. How insignificant that is. And yet, this whole universe and all the galaxies are part of space. They're all in space. So it's still numbers. It's still numbers. And how insignificant, he's going to go into the details of the insignificance of the whole creation. And it's, let's go inside. The mashal, k'moi benefesh adam by man. If he says one word, this word that he says is like nothing. So I said, let's compare one word to all the words he's going to say in his lifetime. So let's say he's going to say his lifetime a trillion words, ten trillion words. So one word compared to a trillion or ten trillion is insignificant. But he's saying more. Compare one word to his power of speech. The power of speech that we have in ourselves is the power of speech to speak in, as long as you live. There's no limit to the power of speech. Hashem could has Hashem pull the plug. But the power of speech, if a person will live a million, he'll be able to speak, keep on speaking. The power of speech is infinite. A person can speak endlessly. So one word compared to the power of speech. So let's say uh, potentially he could speak infinite, infinite amount of words that he has empowered. He doesn't have the power to live an infinite amount of years, but the power of speech in him is, is his, it's, it's the power station that empowers him to speak. One word compared to that. The Kolshkein, the Gabi Prinis, Levush, Hapnimi. And certainly compare that to the, to the Levush Hapnimi, to thought, Shalashah Machshava. Now, here there's a very deep explanation in the Hasidic literature, which we're trying to show the level of insignificance. Of Hashem, of Hashem's speech in creation, right? So he said a few words to create the world. And we're, we're leading to how this is, how the world is insignificant as a result of that. And he's first doing that by comparing this to human speech. Now, one speech of a, of, of a human, one word compared to the power of speech. Now, compare one word. Not only to the power of speech, to his thought process. In order to speak, say a word, first it has to go through thought, right? It starts in the person's, with his feelings. He has feelings or he's thinking about idea, creative idea, with his chachma, bina, and with his emotions. And this brings a thought, and the thought comes out later in speech. What is, what is the difference between sh speech and thought? Speech and thought is totally different quality. Speech, one word compared to the power of speech, is we say insignificant. One word of speech compared to the power of thought is totally insignificant. In a much higher way. And I'll explain. Let's say... Uh, money. So let's say one, one coin compared to a trillion coins. Or one dollar compared to a trillion dollars. Or the Federal Reserve Bank can print, can print infinite amount of money. So it's one dollar compared to the Federal Reserve Bank. U.S. government can print dollars endlessly. So it's, that's, that's an interesting comparison. One dollar to the power of the FRB to print dollars. So one dollar is insignificant. How about this? 
one um, a, a speck of dirt compared to gold. One speck of dirt compared to gold. One speck of dirt compared to gold. If the insignificance of one speck of dirt compared to gold is a different type of insignificance. Why? Because it's not even in the same dimension. This is gold, has value. A, a drop of, of sand has no value when, you, when you're talking about gold. It's a totally different dimension. It's apples and oranges. Apple, orange at least are both fruit. But when you're talking about value, gold has value. And sand, go to the beach. You can take as much sand as you want. So gold has value. You take it, 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 it's a qualitative difference, not only a quantitative difference. One dollar compared to the capability of the FRB to print dollars is a quantitative difference. This can go infinite printing dollars. You're talking about dollars. It's in the same dimension. But it's in quantity. This is infinity. And this is a limited amount, one dollar. When you're talking about... Uh, a, 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 a speck of sand, a grain of sand with, with, with Fort Knox, the gold in Fort Knox, it's, or all the gold in the world, you can't compare this. It's not only that this is all the gold in the world compared to one, one speck of sand, you can't compare it. It's not, the problem is, if, and if you had as much sand as Fort Knox gold or the gold in the world, you'd be ahead, you'd also have nothing. Because it's, it's in a totally different dimension. Similarly, he's trying to get to one word compared to the power of speech is at least in the dimension of speech. But when you compare one word to thought, thought is like gold compared to speech. And this is explained in Hasidic, I call it, call it psychology. The difference between speech and thought is like the difference between sand and gold in the following way of course speech has value but it's it's two different dimensions speech a person doesn't need for his personal development if i'm living in an island just give me a library and food i can live in an island potentially me so many people and they're going to be kept busy. They don't have to say a word. Speech is for communication when there's people outside of him. So with his personal development, he can develop himself without speech. But without thought, he can't develop himself. A person's thought is to think. Through that he understands. Through that he is calmed. Through that he, he can reach greatness. The tool that develops the person is his thought. So that's deeper, much deeper than speech. Speech to thought, when you compare speech to thought, this is gold. The gold standard is thought. Now if you want to influence people, so yes, of course you need speech. But as we're talking about personal development, you don't really need speech. And therefore, when you compare one word to infinite speech, it's insignificant. When you compare in, in quantity, when you compare one word to infinite thought, this is totally it, it's insignificant as far as 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 dimension is concerned. Because thought is the source of speech. Now let's take this a step further. Compare one word, not only to the infinite capability of speech, not only to the capability of thought, but to the, his, his, his soul, his wisdom, his essence himself, which ultimately gives rise to his thought and to his speech. So one, speech, one word compared to his person, personality, his, his essence, Think of how insignificant it is. Actually, look at this. 
So he explains over here that if you take one word compared to this kapara speech and compare it to thought and compare that to the person, his, his emotions and his intelligence, one word is how insignificant it is. So if one, one person, compare it to the entire planet, seven billion people, how insignificant it is. Compare it to all of the living beings on planet Earth. Compare it to all of the stars that exist in all of the galaxies, to planet Earth. How insignificant is one person? So therefore, when Hashem created the world, who is the whole existence and the galaxies and everything is just one speck of godly energy that flow to create the whole universe and everything that's in it, how insignificant all of this is. So really, the only real existence is Hashem. Now, we're going to have to continue next week to talk about the nature of insignificance. And really, the, the, the idea of insignificance is something that philosophers have dwelled upon and psychologists have dwelled upon um, the dread that somebody may have realizing his insignificance. And here Yiddishkeit is saying, on one hand, how insignificant we are, which he's getting to, and how on the other hand, how important, how significant and important our existence is, because Hashem made us. So the question we have to ask, so, but I'm here, and I'm living, and my day is in front of me, and what am I going to do with my day? So on one hand, I'm insignificant. But on the other hand, Hashem made me. Do I recognize my dependency in Hashem? So I'm going to do mitzvahs. I'm going to live my life the way Hashem wants me to. What happens if I say, no, I'm going to do what I want to do? That I'm not recognizing my real existence. That really, I'm denying my place in the universe. That really, I'm dependent on Hashem. And I'm going again, I'm, I'm not willing to recognize the reality that the only real existence is Hashem. I'm rebelling against the reality the only real existence in Hashem. Because me and my ego and everything that comes with it is really a, a reflection of Hashem's creation. And I have to recognize that. And if I'm doing anything against that, I'm rebelling against that recognition. So I'm going against the unity of Hashem, the oneness of Hashem. I'm saying I'm, I, I'm significant. So then I'm saying, well, Hashem has competition. Up until now, the only real significant existence was Hashem. The only real existence is Hashem. So we, when we recognize that, we're part of Hashem's plan. Our, then we get real greatness and real significance. Because Hashem is the only real true existence, and I can be part of that. And if I don't want to be part of that, and I want to, so to say, break away from that, that's a form of idol worship. So we're going to develop this idea, first the insignificance, and therefore the only reality is Hashem, and the importance of us recognizing that reality, and if we don't recognize the reality, that is a, a form of idol worship, because we're denying the reality of how significant we, we really are, and how our true significance is really coming from Hashem. Totally coming from Hashem. So this is, on one hand, today's shir was deep Kabbalistic philosophy. And on this subject, many, many pages of chassid developed more intensely what we touched upon. It's going to be continue, touching it about the next, the, next, uh, the next class also. But the bottom line is, to accept and recognize how it is in our choice every day. We wake up in the morning. What are you going to do with this day? Do you think your life, you're going to do things in your life? 
You have a choice. It could do, be th- things of insignificance because truly you're reckon- because you're truly insignificant, and all the dread and existential uh, challenges that a person may have from that, or you can forget about it and get drunk with uh, momentary pleasures, or you could become something larger than life by recognizing that really you're part of Hashem's plan and notwithstanding the reality of your insignificance because Hashem put you there and He gave you the opportunity to change this world and make this world a better place now you really do count and you really are something Good night